the spring of 1864, Ulysses Grant endured terrible casualties to his army as he chased Robert E. Lee's Confederates ever closer to Richmond. At last, Grant found himself at a dusty crossroads, only nine miles from the Confederate capital. If his army could break through here, the war would be over in days. But orders went awry, and Lee's army was given time to prepare an impregnable system of trenches. When the Union attack was finally made, Grant's forces were slaughtered. It would be remembered as the tragedy of Cold Harbor. In a corner of this old cemetery in Winstead, Connecticut, lies the grave of Elisha Strong Kellogg. He once made his living as a toolmaker here in Winstead, but history does not remember him for that. For in 1864, Kellogg was a colonel in the Union Army and led a regiment into one of the Civil War's deadliest battles. This fight has never had the fame of Gettysburg or Antietam or Bull Run. But for Kellogg and thousands of others who were killed there, the Battle of Cold Harbor was hell on earth. On June 1st of 1864, Elisha Kellogg was in command of the 2nd Connecticut Heavy Artillery Regiment. At five o'clock on that afternoon, he led his men out of their trenches, and with many other federal units, started toward heavily entrenched Confederates. This was the first time these men of Connecticut had ever been in such combat. Luck had placed them on one of the deadliest battlefields of the Civil War. Elisha Kellogg led the way, his cap held high on the tip of his sword. He looked for all the world like an old hand at facing death. The first Confederate volley was high and few of Kellogg's men fell, but the colonel knew that the next time his men would not be so lucky. Just as the enemy was about to fire their next volley, he ordered his men to lie down. The command worked, the fire passed over them, and the second resumed its march almost intact. They at last neared the Confederate trenches. Now, suddenly, the rebel fire seemed to come from all directions. There was no escaping it. Private Lewis Bissell was there. The men began to fall, and oh, this storm of lead and rain that was poured into us cannot be described. The roar of musketry was terrible, but not so awful as the cries of the wounded. Almost 16,000 soldiers, most of them Union, fell during this battle, named after an obscure spot on the map of eastern Virginia. But Cold Harbor was only the final awful culmination of a campaign started that spring by the new commander of all Union forces, Ulysses Grant. In the spring of 1864, Lincoln had to have somebody in the Eastern Theater who could win victories for him. Grant was unlike any of the other generals that Lincoln had worked with. Uh, Lincoln respected Grant. He said, Grant fights. Grant was fearless and he was innovative. Uh, Grant was ready to try things that most mil military commanders would have shied away from. Lincoln pinned a third star on Grant's shoulder and sent him forth with the hope that this general had a better plan than his predecessors. He did. I think Grant understood very well that Lee's army was the target. I think his principal goal, his clear principal goal, uh, was to engage Robert E. Lee's army, tie it down, bleed it to the greatest extent possible, and if everything went well in that direction, Richmond would fall. Grant would allow George Gordon Meade to remain as commander of the Army of the Potomac. But Grant would give the orders. They were simple. Lee's army would be your objective. Wherever Lee goes, there you will go also. 
All winter, the two opposing armies had stared at each other across the Rapidan River in northern Virginia, but by May, Grant was ready to go after Lee. On the 4th of that month, the Army of the Potomac crossed the Rapidan and moved into an area of dense undergrowth and timber known locally as the Wilderness. It was Grant's hope that he could cross through this tangled maze and bring the Confederates to battle in the open country beyond. But Lee moved to intercept the Federal Army on the edge of the old Chancellorsville battlefield. There were a lot of gullies, a lot of swamps. It was probably the worst place you could imagine for armies to fight. Uh, soldiers couldn't see more than five or six men down the line before they'd get lost in the trees. For two days, the armies fought in this dense woodland. There were tremendous casualties, but at the end of those days, Lee had fought Grant to stalemate. Grant lost 17,000 men at the Battle of the Wilderness. It is said that on receiving the casualty figures, he went into his tent and wept. At the conclusion of the battle, Grant had to decide whether to retreat as all former Union commanders would have done, or keep pushing south. It's one of the dramatic moments in the history of the armies in Virginia. Grant turned south and the army followed and there was a shout that the soldiers wrote about for years to come. They now knew that Grant was going to stick with them, that he was going to follow the war to the end, that there were to be no more retreats. Grant now headed for the strategic Spotsylvania courthouse. Less than a week after the wilderness, he hurled thousands of men at well-entrenched Confederates. The terrible battle at Spotsylvania was indecisive, but it must have made two facts abundantly clear to Robert E. Lee. Lee's army was worn down to the point in which he couldn't mount a, a, a massive counterattack. Uh, the kind of things that had won for him at Second uh, Bull Run and at Chancellorsville, uh, he couldn't mount that kind of an attack uh, again. The Army of Northern Virginia was killing Yankees at an alarming rate. But for the dream of the Confederacy to stay alive, Lee's army needed victories, not simply courageous defense. The second fact that must now have been clear to Lee was that he faced a new kind of opponent. Grant's decision to turn south told Lee a lot about his opponent, too. This was a general of the likes of which he had yet to see. This was a man who was going to fight. This is a man who would not admit defeat. Grant now wired Washington. I intend to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer. He was playing for keeps. He would not stop until he had annihilated Lee's army or lost his own in the struggle. As Grant moved south in this spring of 1864, his army had been taking enormous casualties. In two and a half weeks, the Army of the Potomac had lost 33,000 men, or almost 2,000 a day. Even the great arsenal of the North could not easily make up such tremendous losses. And even if it could, Grant would not slow down his campaign to wait for new recruits to be trained. He now turned to an untried source for replacements. In order to place the losses from the Wilderness and Spotsylvania Courthouse, Grant called on his final reserves. There were some units that were called heavy artillery units that were in Washington, D.C. and other places. They generally engaged in parades and guarded the forts around the capitals. Grant called on them now to come into Virginia, uh, join the Army of the Potomac, and join the fighting. As these men moved toward the battlefields, they were derided by the combat veterans as bandbox soldiers who had sat out the war with safe, comfortable assignments. Now these untested troops would have to take the place of the thousands who had fallen. The 2nd Connecticut Heavy Artillery was typical of these regiments. Like other such units, the 2nd had spent the war manning the forts around Washington. Their adjutant was Captain Theodore Vale. He had been a public school teacher when the Connecticut Regiment was formed in 1862. Vale reported to the imposing commanding officer of the regiment, Colonel Elisha Kellogg. 
Kellogg had been a sailor in the British merchant fleet and prospected for gold in California before marrying and settling in Winstead, Connecticut as a machinist. Burly and red-faced, he took his assignment with the regiment very seriously. He drilled his men incessantly and could be a bully on the parade ground. But Kellogg genuinely cared about his men, and they grew to respect and admire him. Captain Vale. The men who were cursing him one day for the almost intolerable rigors of his discipline would in 24 hours be throwing up their caps for him or subscribing to buy him a new horse. The 8th New York Heavy Artillery had much in common with the 2nd Connecticut. It came from the rolling country of small farms and hamlets near Niagara Falls, New York. The regiment was formed by Colonel Peter A. Porter, a Harvard graduate. Porter had been a member of the New York State Senate when the war broke out. The men he led would also come to be very devoted to him. Men like Sergeant John Sherman, he came from a small town. Batavia, New York, and like most, he now headed toward combat with friends he'd grown up with. Captain Joel Baker was from Lockport, New York, and had also been a public school teacher before the war. Private William Murphy was an apple farmer from Lockport. Murphy had come to America from Ireland when he was six. Like other Irish, he had rushed to defend his adopted country when the call came. Colonel Porter had never missed an opportunity to request transfer from the boredom of guard duty and get his men into action. Now he would get his wish. While Grant had sustained huge losses, he could eventually replace them. But Robert E. Lee's casualties this spring were gone for good. His once great army was a shadow of its former self. Three years of war had also robbed Lee of lieutenants who could not be replaced. Jackson was dead, Longstreet had been seriously wounded, A.P. Hill was sick and had lost the fire that had once made him an invaluable officer. The losses were so high, particularly in the field officers, that Lee felt that he could not uh, retain the initiative. Uh, he had to dance to Grant's tune. The best that he could hope to do was hold them in check and hopefully uh, do it long enough that there would be a political victory. But morale in Lee's army remained remarkably high, and the ranks during this April were still filled with dedicated fighters who worshipped their commander. Brigadier General Thomas Klingman was a 52-year-old North Carolina lawyer and politician who now commanded a brigade south of Richmond. He would soon be sent to join Lee. Colonel William Oates of the 15th Alabama had been a cotton planter before the war. He had been with Lee in his greatest battles and now drove his men to keep up with the Yankees. Day after day, Grant and Lee struggled to gain a position of advantage. The pattern of the campaign had been consistent. Grant trying to get around Lee, pull him out in the open, Lee moving to block Grant's moves. Uh, Fire sparking every day, battles happening every day, men getting killed every day. Uh, death becomes a fact of life. By May 20th, Elisha Kellogg and his Green Connecticut troops had joined the army along with Peter Porter in the 8th New York and other inexperienced heavy artillery regiments. They knew their first taste of a big battle lay somewhere ahead on the dusty Virginia roads. The Union troops now crossed river after river, often with a short but spirited fight. At the North Anna in late May, Lee laid a trap. He teased the Federals into attacking him in a position which could have split the Union army and left them open to destruction. The Yankees took the bait and attacked. But Lee's orders were badly coordinated and the trap was never sprung. If he'd been able to spring it, the thing might have been settled there. But he didn't, and a lot of people have blamed, blamed the fact that they didn't follow through their counterattack there on the idea, on the fact that Lee was ill. He was ill with diarrhea for a, a couple of weeks or more, and so weak that for the first time in the war, his troops saw him out inspecting the lines, riding in a borrowed carriage instead of on his horse traveler. On May 28th, Grant fought his way across the Pamunkey River, and Lee knew he was running out of maneuvering room. The James River was only a few miles on up ahead, 
and across that river, the network of railroads which were Richmond's lifelines would be open to attack on a broad front. Lee told an aide, We must destroy this army of Grants before it gets to James. If he gets there, it will become a siege, and then it will be a matter of time. Lee knew that the outskirts of Richmond were no more than nine miles behind him to the west. His invalid wife Mary lay in a house in that city. The constant game of position he'd been playing with the Federal Army must now end. He would have to bring Grant to battle and somehow defeat him. Grant now thought he had found the opportunity he'd waited for. The Confederate Army sat across roads which led directly to Richmond. If the Confederate lines could be broken here, the war could be over in days. Grant was sure he could do it. He wired Washington. Lee's army is really whipped. The prisoners we now take show it. I may be mistaken, but I feel that our success over Lee's army is already assured. Ulysses Grant would soon find out he was indeed mistaken. On May 31st, the Army of the Potomac moved through a countryside of swampy little streams and pine-studded flatlands. The soldiers found the region gloomy and oppressive. It was here that the Confederates had pushed back the Union Army two years earlier in a series of battles known as the Seven Days. The key to controlling the road leading to Richmond was a dusty crossroads whose only feature was a second-rate tavern known locally as Cold Harbor. It was an odd name since it was not close to water. And in June of 1864, temperatures at this cold harbor were running close to 100 degrees. On June 1st, the crossroads at Cold Harbor was held only by Philip Sheridan's Union cavalry. Lee ordered an attack. The attack failed. And by the time it could be reorganized, the Union Sixth Corps had reached the field. Soon, both sides were heavily reinforced and each started digging rifle pits and gun emplacements. Elisha Kellogg had marched the men of his regiment hard to get here. He no doubt sensed the battle was near. Throughout the day, Kellogg supervised the digging of entrenchments and waited for orders. They were not long in coming. George Meade believed that the Confederates could be pushed back and at 4.30 on the afternoon of June 1st, he ordered the first assault. The untested men of the 2nd Connecticut would lead the way. Major Ellis, your 3rd Battalion, 20 yards behind the 2nd Battalion. Colonel Kellogg carefully went over details of the attack, the lay of the land, the positions of the Confederates. He was determined his unit would show the rest of the army that they were no mere bandbox regiment, no dress-up soldiers. They were not cowards, and they would prove it. Captain Theodore Vale described Kellogg's final instructions to his men before the attack. Colonel Kellogg said, Now, men, go in steady. Keep cool, keep still until I order you to charge. And then go in arms apart with a yell. Don't a man of you fire a shot until we are within the enemy's breastworks. I shall be with you. Soldiers uh, ideally are exposed to combat in a sort of gradual way. To do what they had to do on the afternoon of June 1st as their first serious combat was asking a lot. The moment of truth at Cold Harbor had arrived for Kellogg, Vale, and the other men of the 2nd Connecticut Heavy Artillery. With the other 12,000 soldiers of the 6th Corps, Elisha Kellogg and his men moved out. The first volleys were high, and most of the regiment made it to within yards of the Confederate lines. But now other Confederates on both flanks unleashed a withering fire into Theodore Vale and the other blue attackers. 
The air was filled with sulfurous smoke, and the shrieks and howls of more than 250 mangled men rose above the yells of triumphant rebels and the roar of musketry. The second Connecticut was being cut to ribbons. Colonel Kellogg did his best to rally his men, but he must have realized the attack was due. Directly across the line, Confederate Brigadier General Thomas Klingman remembered staring at Elisha Kellogg only ten paces away. A tall and uncommonly fine-looking officer in the front rank of the enemy's column, looking me directly in the face, took off his cap and cheered his men in words I could not catch. Kellogg screamed, about face. He had no sooner made the command when he fell with two shots to the head. Theodore Vale described the chaos around him. Wild and blind with wounds, bruises, noise, smoke, and conflicting orders, the men staggered in every direction, some falling upon the very top of the rebel parapet. The second Connecticut teetered on the edge of panic and rout. Just at this moment of crisis, the brigade commander, Brigadier General Emery Upton, appeared and rallied the Connecticut men. Upton was so caught up in rallying the second Connecticut, he stood behind a tree being handed musket after musket, firing non-stop at Confederates and shouting, Men of Connecticut, stand by me. We must hold this line. And hold they did. Federal units up and down the line have met with mixed results. In most areas, tremendous Union losses had achieved very little. But the Connecticut men had held their position. As darkness fell, the Confederates moved further back to new lines. The untried Connecticut troops had endured terrible fire. Their still fresh, bright blue uniforms stood out where they had fallen. The regiment had lost 386 men. Most in a matter of minutes. The second Connecticut heavy artillery was never again called a bandbox regiment. Ulysses Grant was now confident that if another big attack could be launched the following morning, Lee's army could be broken. He could hear the church bells of Richmond. The biggest prize of the war lay just ahead. Now was the time to grab it. Grant prepared for the attack by ordering General Winfield Scott Hancock to move his second corps in a night march across the back of the entire army to a new position on the Union left. Hancock's corps would have to be in place for an attack at dawn. And it was unbearably hot that evening. It had not rained recently, and the soldiers are almost unanimous in their accounts about the stifling dust. There are stories that some of the horses that were pulling the Second Corps artillery actually died in the road. To make things worse, Meade sent down a young captain to be their guide, and he led them off into the woods and got lost. And so by the time Hancock reached the Coal Harbor front, on the morning of the 2nd, they, his troops were so worn out that Grant agreed to postpone the attack. Sergeant John Sherman's 8th New York Heavy Artillery had moved all night and was relieved to end the exhausting march. The army had stopped at what had been the old Gaines Mill battlefield of 1862. Sergeant Sherman discovered a sad casualty of this previous battle. I took back a load of canteens and started to find a spring. As I started along, I stumbled over a pile of bones and a human skull. Where are we? Someone said over the other side of the ridge was a cluster of buildings known as Cold Harbor. At last, I had found a spring and filled my canteen, but we all had to scatter. 
for a rebel battery had caught sight of us and dropped three or more shells squarely in the pool. Thursday, June 2nd, 1864, passed without fighting. For the Confederates, this delay was a godsend. The Federals gave Lee 36 hours, and the Confederates used that time wisely. They dug entrenchments. We're standing on the entrenchments here at Cold Harbor that were dug by the Confederates. They don't look like much now, but when they were built, they were the most formidable ever constructed on the continent. They dug these ditches about four feet deep. Then they put a head log across the top of the earthen part so that when they stood up to fire, they'd be firing with the log above their head and the earthworks below, giving them complete cover. The simple trenches of the previous day were transformed into fearsome positions that could resist any attack. A summer rain blew in after dark, lessening the heat but doing little to relieve the tension. Even veteran federal troops had a deep sense of foreboding about what awaited them in the morning. Some read and reread letters from home. Others used the time to sew slips of paper with their names into their uniforms so their bodies could be identified. The 8th New York would be one of the lead units in the attack. Like Elisha Keller, Colonel Peter Porter hoped his men would give a good account of themselves. But something else must have gripped Porter on this night, some premonition of what dawn would bring. His second in command, Major James Willett, remembered. The Colonel was vigilant. I don't think he slept at all that night. He called on me before daylight, and we sat down on a log to drink our coffee and talked over the charge we expected to make at dawn. With a smile and a cheerful tone, he spoke a few kind words. He was leaving me when he reached out his hand and with sorrow on his face said, Goodbye, Major, and was gone. few hours, Porter Willett and the men of the 8th New York would face their destiny in a great battle. June 3rd, 1864, dawned gray and misty. George Meade would later claim he had instructed his corps commanders to carefully scout out the Confederate positions in preparation for the attack on this morning. If true, his orders went largely ignored. The Federal Army faced an enemy entrenched in positions they could barely see and knew virtually nothing about. Finally, the sun began to break through and bugles sounded, calling the men of the Union to their duty. Along with 50,000 of their comrades, the 8th New York waited to attack. At last, it would begin and the life of each man who had found his way to this place would never be the same. Major Willett. I saw Colonel Porter suddenly appear up on the top of the breastworks. As the Colonel, a few yards in advance, waved his sword, the line went forward into that terrible fire. Come on, New York! situation was quickly apparent. The Confederate earthworks were so well designed that every spot on the line was covered by converging fire. Confederate General Evander Law described the results. I had seen the dreadful carnage of Fredericksburg and its second Manassas, but I had seen nothing to exceed this. It was not war, it was murder. By chance, the men of General Francis Barlow's brigade hit the only weak spot on the Confederate line. The fighting was frantic. 2,000 men slashed, stabbed, and clubbed one another, since there was no room to reload muskets. Barlow's men at last drove off the Southerners and took over 200 prisoners.
This was virtually the only Union success of the day, and it was short-lived. Men from Maryland and Florida rallied and delivered a murderous crossfire which drove the Yankees back. On the northern end of the line, Confederate Colonel William Holtz, the former cotton planter from Alabama, described the carnage which met Massachusetts soldiers. The fire was terrific from my regiment. I could see the dust fog out of a man's clothing in two or three places at once. All up and down the Union line, regiments became entangled. Commanders lost track of their men. Where units remained cohesive, whole companies fell as if by command. In spite of the slaughter, everywhere there were moments of incredible bravery. On the north end of the attack, a color bearer in the 18th Corps marched boldly toward the Alabama defenders, totally unaware that he was the last man still standing from his unit. Amazed at his persistence, the Confederates held their fire. As the unarmed man continued, they stood up and waved for him to go back. The soldier at last realized he was alone, but he refused to panic. Instead, he smartly saluted the enemy, did an about-face, and marched back the way he had come. The Alabamians cheered until the retreating Yankee was out of sight. Amazingly, the men of the 8th had struggled to within 20 feet of the Confederate breastworks. As they drew near, the color bearer of the 8th went down. Now Colonel Porter, the promising young politician from upstate New York, picked up the flag and headed toward the enemy parapet and certain death. Private William Murphy looked on. Colonel Porter fell at the head of his regiment, shot through the throat. He struggled only to be felled again. He rose to his knees and gasped his last order to his men. Guide on the colors. He fell forward and died. His body pierced by six bullets. The 8th New York lost 505 men, almost a third of its number. All along the two miles of the Union attack, the results were much the same. Those who had survived were quickly pinned down. The troops searched for some protection from the merciless fire. Frantically, they began to dig. Many scooped out shallow depressions in the soil using bayonets, cups, or their hands. Little by little, the Confederates ceased their firing. No one was still standing to fire at. In all the war, no Union attack was ever broken as easily or as quickly as this. Over 6,000 Federal soldiers had fallen in little over half an hour. Their effort had been a total disaster. The attack had been repulsed so quickly, Lee did not at first believe he had carried the day. But little by little, the word came back. Never had the Army of Northern Virginia achieved such a cheap victory. Their losses were fewer than 1,500. Lee was fortunate. He admitted to one visitor that he had not one regiment in reserve at the height of the attack. George Meade had been in the rear and hadn't witnessed the results of the disastrous charge. Now he ordered his generals to renew the attack. But his corps commanders could see what had happened to their men, and none took Meade's order seriously. In shock, General Hancock sent back word that the attack was long over. General Baldy Smith, 18th Corps commander, flatly refused to obey. And Colonel Thomas Barker, furious at the decimation of his 12th New Hampshire regiment, said, I'll not take my regiment in another such charge if Jesus Christ himself should order it. Both sides spent the remainder of the day in their positions. The bodies of the dead and dying Federals lay where they had fallen. Captain Joel Baker of the 8th New York remembered. Oh, what a terrible loss my company had. Many of them I loved as though they were my brothers. The dead still lie where they fell. 
Our poor colonel was killed. Over 600 of our regiment fell. How proudly, two days ago, it unfurled its banners and rushed into the destruction before it. All that long, hot day and throughout the night, the living listened to the pleas of the dying. One Yankee would say of Cold Harbor, this is truly the valley of the shadow of death. Throughout the night, federal troops worked hard at preparing their own entrenchments. All knew they had suffered a major defeat, and they struggled to prepare for a Confederate counter-assault. There would be no counter-assault. Now the same kind of fortifications which had repulsed the Union troops prevented Lee's army from following up on its victory. As the days went by, the elation of the survivors quickly drained. Lying motionless in wool uniforms under a blistering sun was misery. Those brave enough to go to the rear for water took their life in their hands. Any movement often meant instant death. Infantrymen on both sides hated sharpshooters. A hidden gunman was thought of as little better than a murderer. The death of an enemy sniper was always cause for celebration. Even after the sunset, men rarely left their trenches. But on the night of June 5th, the men of the 8th New York could no longer stand the sight of Colonel Porter's body lying on the field in front of them. A soldier in the 8th remembered. The following night, five men volunteered to bring in his body. Sergeant Williams crept up to the body and fastened a rope around the Colonel's sword belt while the other men waited farther back. He was forced to lie by the side of his dead colonel for several hours simulating death to escape the attention of a rebel officer. The body was then drawn off the field. Sergeant Williams' exploit won him a lieutenant's commission and a medal of honor. But the retrieval of Colonel Porter's body was the exception. Most bodies lay where they had fallen. By the third day of the stalemate, the stench of rotting corpses was overpowering. Grant suggested to Lee that local commanders send out a white flag and bring in the wounded directly in their front. But Lee insisted on being asked for a formal truce. And uh, Grant was unwilling to do this at first because he knew very well that that was by tradition admission that he'd been defeated to ask for such a truce. All day on June 6th and much of the 7th, nothing happened. But at last, Grant relented, and four days after the battle, both sides moved onto the field. It was too late to help all but a few of the wounded. But after so much killing and the fear and frustration of sitting in trenches, Confederate and Yankee alike eagerly welcomed the truce. Now, mortal enemies shook each other's hands, swapped stories and traded small items. For most, it may have represented an irresistible urge to put a human face on the forms they'd so recently tried to destroy. A Georgia boy said, we met and talked with them as if they were old friends. But such comfort could not last. After an hour, the men went back to their trenches. For another five days, they prayed for the order to leave this awful place. Finally, on June 12th, they would get their wish. The Battle of Cold Harbor was over at last. Grant would now skillfully take his army out of their lines, cross the James River, and attack the rail center at Petersburg. His plan would succeed, but he could not know it would mean almost another year in still more trenches. With the advantage of hindsight, we can see that Cold Harbor uh, was uh, a turning point in how men fought wars in this country. Never again would you see troops standing up in open fields, shooting at each other as they had during most of the Civil War. Henceforth, whenever the armies met, they would entrench. Almost 12,000 Union soldiers had died, proving the effectiveness of trench warfare.
Grant's decision to launch the attack would forever be the greatest stain on his war record. Ulysses Grant was a fighter who hated to admit mistakes, but he could not ignore what had happened. He would say of Cold Harbor, I regret this assault more than any one I ever ordered. If Grant had been able to, to do what he tried to do at Cold Harbor, the war might have been over a year earlier and tens of thousands of troops who died wouldn't have died. But as Lee had said, uh, the war of siege began and after that it was just a matter of time. As the Union Army left the trenches and crossed the James on its inexorable path to victory, those who survived the agony of Cold Harbor longed for a time when the killing would at last end. Ten months later, that peace would finally arrive. Elisha Kellogg and Peter Porter would never see the peace. Their bodies were returned and buried in the soil of their home states. Theodore Vail survived the attack on June 1st and became a newspaper man in Winston, Connecticut, where he wrote a book about his experiences at Cold Harbor. Colonel William Oates, who had watched his troops kill so many Yankees, would become governor of Alabama and eventually lead troops again in the Spanish-American War. Private William Murphy, wounded in the 8th New York's fateful charge, was lucky to survive three days lying on the Cold Harbor battlefield. He would at last return to his apple farm near Niagara Falls and father 11 children. Joel Baker returned to teaching but would live for only seven years after the war. Thomas Klingman, who had looked on as Elisha Kellogg died on the Confederate parapet, returned to North Carolina to practice law after the war. Sergeant John Sherman, who tripped over the skeleton, would be captured after Cold Harbor. He weighed less than 80 pounds when he was at last found by Union troops. But Sherman would go on to outlive this war by 57 years. All of these men would finally be joyously welcomed back by family and friends. For those who waited at home had also suffered terribly from the endless battles. On June 5th, 1864, a mother from Litchfield, Connecticut, wrote to her son Lyman, who was a private in Elisha Kellogg's second Connecticut. Dearest son, I don't know as this will reach you, my beloved Lyman, but I must write. For you are in my thoughts all the while. We read the papers daily and look fearfully for your name among the killed and wounded. May God, who I trust has hitherto kept you, continue to watch over you and cover your head in the day of battle. Everything is beautiful here now. I would write you about the farm, but I have no heart to do it. For all less subjects are swallowed up in our great anxiety for your present safety. Your father says, give my love to Lyman and tell him I hope he may be spared to come home. With deep affection, I am your mother, Julia. Julia's letter would be returned unopened by the regimental chaplain. Her son, Lyman Smith, had died in the second Connecticut's attack on June 1st at the dreadful battle that was Cold Harbor. <laughs>